Yes, good morning. Good morning, Redeemer family. Welcome in the name of our risen Savior. And we are headed to Easter. Uh, it's going to be here before you know it. And I thought that I would share some words relative to Easter, especially since the next song we're going to sing is brand new, at least new to us. And it, its topic is the resurrection. Uh, a few words from Luke 24. But by the way, it's hard to keep that little image of Madeline running back and forth in great joy. How many would like to see Chuck running around with his arms yeah. waving? Wouldn't you like to see that this morning? <laughs> anyway, that's a P.S. Steal home plate, Chuck. On resurrection morning, as Luke records it in 24, 13, Two people, Clopas and his wife Mary, are trudging along to Emmaus. They're discouraged and depressed. The crucifixion of Jesus has shattered all their dreams. That was not on their radar. That was not supposed to be part of the messianic plan in their mind. Jesus, of course, comes up and they're kept from recognizing him. And he gets them in a conversation. He goes, what are you talking about? And they're just flabbergasted. You're the only dude in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? What? What's going on? And they explain about the death of this prophet named Jesus. Now, here they are, sad, depressed, disappointed. And what did Jesus, as the great physician of the heart, do to bring faith in the resurrection of Jesus? What did he do? Did he say, guys, I tell you what, let's take a hike to the empty tomb. Because it was just out down the road. The empty tomb was just down the road. They could have gone to the empty tomb. In fact, the women had gone there, saw the empty tomb, made the report to the disciples. The disciples went back. Yeah, empty tomb. You know what? Empty tombs don't bring faith. The church tells you that today. Go to the empty tomb and see it. Baloney. No. He could have said that. Second thing Jesus didn't do was have a dramatic presentation of himself. Some spectacular uh, demonstration to them that he was alive. He didn't do it. Could he have done that? He could have said, hey guys, it's me. Hello. He didn't do it. How do you create faith? And the resurrection. Go to the Holy Land and see the empty tomb? No. Spectacular presentation? No. What did he do? He took them through the Old Testament from a canonical perspective and showed that that whole Old Testament predicted him. How do you create faith? By listening to the Word of God explained and interpret it from a canonical standpoint. And they finally got it. That's why we gather and celebrate the resurrection, celebrate Christianity, celebrate the gospel in song, full of the gospel, full of the scripture, and teaching each time. That's what builds faith. I believe someone said, faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? Hearing. Let's celebrate the gospel and do so by beginning with prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you are the great physician. You know our need, and you know often the reason for our discouragement is unbelief. We just are slow to believe what we read. Thank you that you're willing to take our unbelief and to transform it into faith by taking us to your word, to your voice. We've gathered to hear the voice of Jesus in song, in word, and even through the words of one another today. Let there be, Lord, combustion. Let there be this morning new faith where there is a dead faith. Let there be hope where there is despair. And encouragement while there's discouragement. Bring light where there's darkness. Use your word. You're such a great doctor of the heart. And you've got to answer to everyone's challenge that they face here. Do that, Lord. We will glorify you. We will love you. And ask you to continue, Lord, to do a great work among us as we gather in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's worship. Glory. Right. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Janae. And the whole family, the whole production crew.
now there's more than one person involved in putting that together every single week and doing such a great job. Hats off to the whole family. Thank you and thank you. Guess I'm finally ready. Let's do this. Pray with me. We have heard your word, Lord, through the mouths of babes and infants, little girls, who sincerely, their hearts, into their expressions, their reading, their songs. Bless what they do, Lord, to the hearts of children and dads and moms. And do the same as we interact, Lord, with the words of Jesus from Luke's Gospel. They are more than words. They're more than black ink on white paper. <clears throat> They're more than what we see in our phone if we have an electronic version of Scripture. These words are life. They are life-giving. They are food for our soul. And we depend on the Holy Spirit to take what is dead on the page and make it alive. To, to push that blood, Lord, through our spiritual veins. To impact our heart, to make it beat for you. We need it, Lord. We are embattled. We are facing an onslaught from all sorts of discouragements and challenges throughout the week within ourselves and from without. We need your help. And we're trusting that you will take your word and use it train us, and equip us to do ministry to ourselves, to our families, to our neighbors, as well as to be encouraged deep within. We need your help. All of us here, regardless of where we are in the station of life, we need your help to plead the blood of Christ over our souls, over your word, and beg you, Lord, to come and fill us with your life. We pray this for the glory of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Karen did not plan it this way, but she went a little bit too far with her boyfriend in her relationship with him, and her visit to the doctor confirmed that she was pregnant. She wanted to avoid the humiliation and the shame of pregnancy out of wedlock, and so she did what she never thought she would ever do and that was to go and have an abortion. She could not face the humiliation that she would feel in front of people being married or being pregnant out of wed wedlock. And, like many, she kept her secret, secret from her parents for a period of time. But after the guilt worked overtime on her heart, she knew she needed to tell somebody she needed to explain to somebody who would understand what she had gone through. She needed to confess to someone who cared. So she planned on telling her parents after a couple of years. And the relief that she felt, felt so good of deciding to tell her mom and her father. So she sat them down one day, but all the plans that she had made about how to say it, how to explain it. All her plans just went up the tubes or went down the tubes. The whole sky basically fell in on that little family that afternoon. Mom and Dad became unglued. They were devastated. She said, I wanted to break the news gently, but there was just no way. My parents were so shocked they could not understand or comprehend my feelings. Her mother acted like the victim, 
and the martyr and hid herself for two days in her bedroom, refusing to speak to anybody. And when perchance she met her daughter outside of her bedroom, her mother called her a name, which I will not repeat this morning. She said, I can't even stand to look at you, and went back to her own bedroom and slammed the door. Karen, of course, was crushed. She thought that she would be able to talk to the only people in the world who would understand her feelings. But she discovered that while she could not live with her own guilt, her parents could not live with their guilt either. Her parents could not face or accept what had happened. <clears throat> she found that her parents were not approachable when there was bad news on the agenda. And it would be a long time it would be a long time before she could ever speak to her parents again about anything serious. She decided then and there that she was going to enter the world of sin and live it up, bitter against God, guilty, acting out under anger and depression. Jesus teaches us a better way. Jesus teaches us by his own example about what it means to be approachable to people who have lost their way and made mistakes. Jesus teaches us a better way. You all know people, maybe you are the one, who have lost your way. And you want to come back. You want to confess. Or you have friends or children who need help, who need someone to listen to with understanding, without blowing up, without running away, without feeling like the victim and the martyr. Jesus' words in Luke 15, 1 and 2, help us to understand this dynamic, which is so common in human relationships and human dynamics. So join me for a minute or two as we look at Luke 15, 1 and 2. It's not a long passage. I concede that. But it's preparation for three stories. In response to what happens here in these two verses in Luke 15, Jesus will tell three stories, all in response to the criticism he receives from what he does in verses 1 and 2. All three stories are all linked together, designed as an answer to the problem in verses 1 and 2, which we will look at today. So I invite you to look at this very, very brief passage and notice, as Luke always does, he connects it to the previous passage. It may look like this is a brand new text, but it's not. I'll read it and explain as I go. Now the toll collectors, all of them were toll, or toll, or tax collectors, and all the sinners kept approaching Jesus, crowding around him, in order that they might listen to him. That takes us back to the previous verse. That takes us back to verse 14. Jesus said in verse 14, Salt is good, but if it loses its zing, its seasoning power, how can it be renewed? It's no good, either for the earth or for the manure pile. It only needs to get thrown away. Anyone here with good ears Listen. The next verse, what do we have? We have people at the bottom of the pile in society's ladder doing what? Listening to Jesus. They are putting into practice this whole analogy of salt. If I can review for a brief minute. The analogy of salt is often misunderstood. In this case, Jesus gives the analogy of self is that when we, on our way to the heavenly banquet, the celestial city, when we are trudging along in the pathway of life to the celestial city, we will discover that people in our life who used to be good friends, good influences in our life, or possessions that we used to own that had no impact on us, homes and cars and businesses and friendships, there comes a time when some of those things are no longer good in our life. They detract from us. They destroy our faith. They discourage us. 
And Jesus says, like so, they need to be discarded. That means people, relationships, friends, possessions. Those things are now a detraction to us. We need to discard them. Here's a group of people, chapter 15, verse 1. Don't bother about the chapter divisions. Those chapter divisions were not put there by God. People put them there. And so often they create a divide between passages. But there is no divide. Here are people, sinners, and who? Tax collectors. You can't get worse than that in society. And what have they done? They've tasted their life and realized this is going nowhere. I've chased these rainbows. I've lived a loose life. You know, it's getting me nowhere. It does not satisfy. So what do they do? Instead of hanging around with their old buddies and their old friends, what do they start doing? They start hanging around Jesus. Why? Because when they listen to Him, they have hope. There's something that satisfies when they listen to Him. Take a look at what the verb has to say. Or take a look at this verb again. The tax collectors, the toll collectors, and sinners kept crowding around him, approaching him so that they could listen to him. The verse or the phrase kept approaching him is in the imperfect tense. Sorry to be technical here. It has the idea that this is what they started to do on an ongoing basis. This became their habit. It's not a one-time affair. It's not, I, hey, Jesus, tell us a story, and then I'll be on my way. No, these are people at the bottom of the ladder, downtrodden, despised, who are saying, you know, there's got to be more to life than this party. This is creating nothing but emptiness in me. We want something more. And they've heard this invitation by Jesus to go into the highways and the byways, to go outside the walls of the cities and invite everyone in. Everyone is invited. And they thought, well, maybe that includes me. Maybe me, the worst of the worst, despised by the culture. Maybe there's room for me at that table. Maybe I'll get there and there's a chair with my name on it. And the answer, of course, is yes. So they start listening to the voice of Jesus. I need to stop here just for a minute. If you want a fresh start with God, You've walked away from God. You want to come back? You're in no man's land and you want to come back? What do you need to start doing? Listening to someone who can interpret the words of Scripture to you. Someone who can take the words of Jesus and interpret them correctly in context to understand the kingdom of God, to understand the love of God and the grace and mercy of God and how to live life in a culture like this. That is the place for a fresh start. It's not a one-time deal. It's a habit. If I find someone in life who's been down and out for years and years, I will say, one of the things you have to do in order to make that fresh a real start and not a false start is get under the teaching of someone who knows what they're talking about and stay with that person. Otherwise, your fresh start is going to end up where? As a false start. Nothing can sustain you other than the eternal words of Jesus. And this is what these people are realizing. Notice, not attend the church, go through some liturgy. No, listen to the words of Jesus. They came not to be healed, not for a free lunch, not to be razzled-dazzled and to be entertained. They came to what? To listen. They came to hear. <clears throat> in order that they might be able to hear him. Notice the second thing. Pharisees in response, verse 2, and the scholars, just like there's sinners and toll collectors, here are the people at the top of the heap. The Pharisees and the scholars, the scribes, the people who were experts in the law, they started to grumble against to each other. Notice, they're not talking to Jesus, are they? They're not bringing their complaint to Jesus. What are they doing? They do what church leaders do all the time. They grumble to each other, and they don't talk to the people who they need to talk to. They don't go face to face. They don't get in the, in the guy's face and say, you know what? We see you eating with sinners. We see you hanging around sinners. What's going on? What do they do instead? They grumble, and they grumble to each other. And what do they grumble about? This guy receives sinners and he even 
eats with them? What's in their mind? What are they assuming about Jesus? I should add here, the word this one is spoken with a, a sense of uh, derision in their voice. This one receives sinners. Let's think about that word for a minute. Decoline. It's the same word used of Mary and Martha in chapter 10, verse 38 to 42 of Luke's Gospel. Two sisters who welcomed Jesus into their home in order to be with him and in order that Mary could sit at his feet and listen to him. It's the same word. And Luke uses that same tense, the imperfect tense. He receives them. Not a one-time event. He receives them as a habit. This Jesus, look at what he does. His habit is to always receive these people instead of rejecting them, instead of keeping them at arm's length. What's the assumption in their minds? Is that if you're a holy man, that you don't allow your holiness to be polluted by sinners. What's the problem with that? Our holiness is never destroyed or compromised by hanging around sinners. That would say that our holiness is weak. No, Jesus being a holy son of God mingles with sinners because his holiness will rub off. And that holiness is love and mercy and grace in action. And they feel it. They feel it when they're hanging around him. They don't feel judged. They don't feel like Jesus is looking down on us because we have lived a loose life or we've been at the bottom of the barrel. They felt acceptance by Jesus. And then he goes further. He eats with them. What's the problem with that in your mind? Well, when you eat with someone, you have a bond with them. You establish a friendship. You establish a relationship of respect. And here Jesus is eating with the people, having supper with the people at the bottom of the barrel. He's got a problem. No, you have a problem. <laughs> this is what church leaders ought to be doing across the country. They ought to be known for hanging out with the worst people in the culture. Not sitting on some high and mighty throne on the platform of a church in their three-piece suit, but down in the dumps, down in the dregs, down in the prisons, down in the ditches with people who are broken. Leaders need to be all the time as a habit. That brings credibility to the gospel. And when those people hang around those church leaders, what they ought to hear is what? Judgmentalism? No. Is, well, he listens to people. He listens to people like he did the two people on the road to Emmaus by that question. What things? What's going on? And he listened to them and was able to diagnose the problem. This guy welcomes sinners and he even eats with them. In response, Jesus tells three stories. The first story, and I'm not going to win it today, is the story of the sheep owner who lost a sheep, and he goes and finds it. And when he gets home, he invites his friends and his neighbors over and says to them, celebrate with me. That's a contradiction, isn't it, from what we just read in chapter 14. Luke appears like he's a little bit incoherent. He lost, he lost a bit of thinking ability because we're told in the previous chapter, don't invite your friends and relatives, right? <laughs> if you've learned to observe the text, you will see contradictions everywhere in the scripture. They're not meant to cast doubt on the scripture. They're meant to help us to study even more deeply. Like, for example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, right? What does 1 John, written by the same man, say in chapter 2? Do not love the world, neither the things in the world. If any man loves the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's like, John, did you change your mind? God loves the world? Don't love the world. John's gospel is full of contradictions. If you've learned to observe the text, you'll see them everywhere. And John is helping us to go into the text more deeply.
Just like Luke is contradicting himself, but he's not. We have to go to the context to figure out what he means in this particular context. And all of those contradictions are cleared up. John's Gospel is packed with them, and they're on purpose. Luke, they're there, but you have to study the context. Even Paul contradicts himself in one of the most controversial verses that I know of in the New Testament. Uh, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 16 of Colossians, uh, if I can read it, he says, uh, Let the word about Christ, which is found in Scripture, be at home among you. You is plural, men and women among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. What did he just say? He just said that men and women are supposed to teach and admonish one another. Using what? Using the words about Christ in Scripture. Now wait a minute. <laughs> that means that women are told to teach men and that means that Paul is saying that women are to teach men and to admonish men using the scriptures. That's explicit. It's a verse the traditionalists don't like. And they sweep it under the rug because it contradicts what? What they think 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 means. Often the contradictions in Paul, Paul's epistles, unlike John's, are not deliberate. It's a problem of translations. It's the problem of the English translations. And Paul gets treated as an incoherent fool by skeptics because they say, look, he says this here and he says this here. Uh, and people who open their mouth and say they know what they're talking about from 1 Timothy 2.12 and say women cannot teach men betray a fundamental ignorance of the Bible and show how silly and yes, how stupid they are. <laughs> You have to take verses in context and understand what's behind the translation. And the translation is often very misleading, especially in our English version of 1 Timothy 2.12. It's a very, very misleading translation of the Bible. Anyways, all I'm saying here this morning is that our Bible is full of what looks like apparent contradictions, both in Paul and John and Luke. They're everywhere. But it takes close study of the text to figure out, okay, how are we going to get our ship through these two icebergs, one on the left and one on the right? Now we're back to our text here in Luke. Beyond don't invite your neighbors, do invite your neighbors. <laughs> what we want to see here in this text is one basic thing. When you study the life of Jesus publicly, who does he spend his time with? The people who are interested in life in listening to him. And what is his response? Sorry, I can't hang around with you. I'm too holy. I'm a holy man. No. He receives them, and he welcomes them. That's the message. It's about a fresh start. So let's think practically here for a minute. These people, sinners, tax collectors, have been kicked around all their life. And maybe they've made some serious moral mistakes. And at the end of the day, they realize, this is getting me nowhere. And they begin to feel guilty. They got wounds in their life, broken relationships all through their life. Those wounds often are the means by which God slips into their life. It's those wounds that open up again so they begin to consider what God has to say. If you, if you yourself are carrying those wounds, self-inflicted or from other people, could I ask you to consider one thing this morning? Instead of becoming bitter about hurts and those wounds, those disappointments in life, and everyone has them, is to allow God to come in and to begin to speak to you, to give you hope, and to heal those wounds.
like these people. And my suggestion, which I perhaps have said already, and at the cost of repetition, I'll say it again, a fresh start for every human, regardless of age or gender, a fresh start is to take an interest in what Jesus has to say. Don't go to the epistles. Go to the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I find that most Christians are raised on the epistles, and they're clueless about the gospels, and their lives show it. They bear little resemblance to Jesus. Read the words of Jesus. Read his lifestyle. Read his habits. Listen to them. And God will start working in your heart. God will start giving you hope. He'll start healing you. And give you a reason for your living. That's the difference between a fresh start and a false start. I know a lot of people who were gung-ho about having a new life. And they went for a while. A couple of months. Maybe even a year. But I find that they never were part of a local church where the Bible was taught verse by verse, plainly, boldly, and black and white. And they drifted because they weren't listening to the words of Jesus. They weren't listening to the words of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, we are eternal beings. The only thing that's going to satisfy us is what? Eternal words from the eternal Son of God. We are made that way. We are made to listen to the voice of the eternal. And it's the words of Jesus, the creator, who has one foot in the kingdom and one foot here on earth, who understands us and can introduce us to a new life and to a start that will finish and not die after a few months or die after a few years. You want a fresh start? Find a steady habit, some place to listen to the word of God to listen to the words of Jesus as he interprets them for us. Second thing that comes to my mind is looking at Jesus or looking at these people who come into our lives who are broken. Like Jesus, he accepts them. Like Jesus, like Jesus um, willingness to receive them and to eat with them means this. They belong to God and God wants them back. Jesus wants to bring them back. He doesn't want to say to them, knock and it will not be open to you. Seek and you will never find. <laughs> Ask and you will never get it. The sign over the door of the Father's house is what? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. So if you are looking for a fresh start, I would say, that's great. God wants you. God wants you back. If you've walked away from God, hear this message. God wants you back. There's a place at the table for you. Please come. Please consider making a fresh start today. And start listening to the words of Jesus like you've never listened before. The Father's interested in you. He is. He wants you back. You belong to him. He has sent his son to bring you back to his father's house. Third, if your habit is to avoid people who are broken, the worst of the worst, look at them with new eyes. People that God wants God is interested in them. And then, if you want to have a chance to speak to these people, to speak hope into their life, and they want, you want them to pay attention to what you're saying about Jesus, listen to them with respect. Don't judge them. Listen to what they went through. Listen to what they're saying. Read the music of their heart. And after a while, like this, Verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15, they will realize, you know, this man did not judge me. Even though I made a mess of my life, he didn't criticize me, he didn't judge me, he didn't look down on me. I never felt like a cheat or a second class citizen in front of him or in front of her. Eventually they say, I want more of this. I feel like a human being. Even though I failed, 
I feel like a human being. I feel like I have dignity when I'm around him. Now you have what? A platform. Now you have credibility. Now you can speak hope into their lives. Lastly, and I'm going to repeat myself. If you're considering a fresh start, something happened in your life, some major disappointment, you've walked away from God, you're not interested in Him anymore, the mark that God's hand is on you is a new interest in what Jesus has to say. That's the mark of people who want a fresh start. If you find someone who has no interest in God, no interest in His Word, no interest in being taught, hand of God is not on that person. But if, regardless of where you've been, you feel that interest in Scripture, that interest in what Jesus has to say, you love to hear the Word of God taught, that's a mark. That's a mark of a fresh start. That's a mark of God's wooing you. And I'd say, today, come back. Today. Start a, start a program. Meet with somebody who will help you. Listen to the words of Jesus and understand what he has to say. It worked for them. It will work for you. The story of Karen did not end well. I began with her. I end with her. But she realized her parents were not approaching her. Not willing to listen to her pain and suffering. She made up her mind being bittered against God and her parents, she was never going to come back. She plunged into a life of repute and sin, as far as I know. If she's still alive, she's still there. The turning point was where? The turning point was Christians could not handle the truth and could not handle bad news and play the victim and the martyr. May God spare us from that type of response to anyone who comes to us and acknowledges failure. God be with us in a great way to be like Jesus and not like Karen's parents. Thanks for listening. God bless us all. With this familiar blessing in just a moment, I think it's going to be posted for us. You've seen this before, but it just seems so applicable to uh, continue to use this as our way of being dismissed with God's blessing. But before we do, uh, what do you do uh, when you hear contradictory things in the Bible? What do you do when you read this and it contradicts this? What should you do? You say both are true. Both are true. God's word is inspired, right? And we find a way through the middle instead of saying, well, this verse is wrong and this verse is right, you find a way through the middle without what, grumbling and complaining. You follow the evidence. This is what we are called to do, is to go with the word where the evidence takes us. And so that would be my word of encouragement to all of us this morning. When you find those contradictions. And there's so many of them. But it takes a humble student to say, you know what, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I need to rethink this issue. Maybe I need to Rethink about my attitude about John or Paul or what have you. Follow the text. And remember, many of, our, many of the things that we've been taught by tradition are based on English translations. And remember, English translations are not inspired. They're made by people who make mistakes. So trust the word of God, but not the word of men. And when God guides us. Now let's finish this morning with Psalm 146. We do not put our trust in people, powerful or popular. We put our trust in you. You are our help. You are our hope. You are our maker. You uphold the causes of the oppressed, the hungry, the prisoner, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. You rule forever. Let us go forth in renewed trust. Thanks be to God. Amen. You are dismissed. Yes.